Heavenly Father, we thank you for this um, passage we're going to be looking at today, where you called Matthew to follow you. We pray that we may hear you calling us to follow you as well today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, many of you will know, if you've been coming regularly, that we've been spending some time in the Gospel of Matthew. But we've entered the sort of summer period, summer season, where uh, different people are preaching on different Sundays, and we kind of gave them liberty to choose whatever passage they like to preach on. And I thought I'd go back to Matthew, uh, because although we've been studying and looking at his gospel for many, many weeks, we haven't actually so examine this passage in Matthew chapter 9 where Matthew actually becomes a Christian. So what Matthew does is he's writing, is he's writing his gospel is that he writes himself into the story. Because there came a time when Matthew's life was turned upside down. He stopped collaborating with the Romans and became not only a Christian, but an apostle. How did that happen? Well, he tells us in Matthew 9. He says there came a moment in his life when he was sitting at the tax collector's desk amassing a fortune for himself. And at that moment, Jesus comes up to him and says, follow me. And that was it. That's what did it. Two words, follow me. Then and there, in that very moment, Matthew gets up and follows. Luke tells us that he left everything, left everything, and followed him. He left everything in the way that Peter, James, and John perhaps didn't leave everything because they could always go back to fishing. But having turned his back on Rome, that was it now. He could never go back to his old job. It's a stunning, stunning moment. In fact, so stunning is it that a great Italian artist called Caravaggio painted the scene. And in the painting, Matthew is sitting at his desk. One hand is placed in the money that he's just collected. And to his side on the right, Jesus is standing. His right hand is lifted up, and he's pointing at Matthew, and you can see the shock on Matthew's face. It's as if he's been struck by lightning. And he can't believe what's happening. The shock, disbelief, amazement, because he knows from that moment on his life is never going to be the same again. And although one hand is still gripping the coins, with his other hand he's pointing at himself. And so in the painting you can follow the line of Jesus' hand pointing at Matthew, and Matthew is pointing at himself, and he's saying, you're calling me? You want me? You want me in your kingdom? You want me to turn my back on the kingdoms of this world? And you want me, Lord, you want me 
to become a subject of your eternal, everlasting kingdom? How, how can this be? How can this be? There is too great a chasm between us. What have I done to deserve this? I've done nothing. I've spent myself, my life, amassing a fortune, betraying my own people, and you are calling me to give me rest, to give me life, to give me hope, to give me what my innermost being is longing for. And it's as if Jesus say, is saying, yes, Matthew, yes, I, I want you. In fact, I'm calling you. I'm commanding you. It's an astonishing painting. I'm no art historian, but I think Caravaggio's painting could well be the greatest painting of a, of a moment when a soul is converted to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So we need you to think about this, about what's happening. What is Matthew telling us? Well, I think you should think about, first of all, is, is the emotional, the emotional power of this encounter. There's Matthew sitting at his, at his desk. He's brought a franchise from the Romans, the Romans that gave him permission to tax, to collect taxes from Rome, from his own people. And so he's completely bought into the systems of this world. He's completely brought into the Roman system, the pagan, oppressive Roman Empire. And this was a very simple operation and very, very lucrative for Matthew. Hugely lucrative. Every day he would get up and um, take his tax collector's desk and all his books and his tax charts and sit in a prominent place in the town and start collecting revenue. And he could tax everything. Everything bought, everything sold. He could tax the axles on your cart. Because the more axles you had, the more wheels you had, the higher the tax. He could levy pedestrian taxes as well, and so it costs you to cross a road or a bridge. The wider the road, the bigger the bridge, the more the tax. And so there are highway taxes and road taxes. He could tax your boat. He could tax the dock where you tied up your boat. He could tax the rope with which you tied up your boat. He could tax every fish that you caught. He could tax every cabbage, every lettuce, every clove of garlic. Every letter you carried could be opened to see if it was conducting business. And so Matthew had this great, great job. Because the deal was that he'd struck with the Roman authorities the Roman authorities said, look, so long as we get a certain amount from this district every year, we're satisfied, but you're free to take a cut on everything that you want. Standing next to him every day was a Roman soldier, a personal bodyguard, to protect him from the seething anger of the crowds, that God represented the power of Rome, that God represented the Roman emperor. And there was Matthew, living in this world, living for what this world could give you. Not giving a moment's thought that there's a world to come. And that world is going to be eternal. This world is temporary. That world's going to be eternal. And so 
the world and the values of this world were the things that motivated him and drove him. And so he did not seek the things of God, not for a moment. Paul tells us that no one is righteous and no one seeks after God. In fact, we spend our lives trying to evade him because we don't trust him, we fear him. But no doubt, deep in his heart and deep in his soul, in those moments, in those three o'clock, two o'clock moments, when you wake up and your mind is kind of clear and defenseless because you haven't got your arguments in place, There are no doubt moments like that where he knew that the things of this world would never satisfy him. I I dare say that at times he felt ashamed. He felt empty because he was fleecing his own people. I dare say in those moments of clarity, he must have thought, is this, is, this, is this where I was born? Is this, is this why I'm in this world? To get rich, is, is that it? And as the days and years pass, no doubt, as with all of us, we realize that we're getting older. And that one day he would die, and one day he'd have to give an account of his life for the way he lived, and that he would be judged on every single thought, every single word, every single deed. Every word that came out of his mouth, he'd have to give an account. Every thought that crossed his mind. He'd have to give an account. But not to worry, because Matthew was very good at suppressing that. We all are. We all have this amazing, amazing ability to know the truth and not know it at one and the same time. You do it, I do it. We can know the truth and not know it. And so there was Matthew knowing the truth, suppressing the truth, because life for him was too good, he was making too much money, and money can blind you. Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of wealth. And so there he was, rich and untouchable, and the Roman soldier standing around him ensured he was untouchable. Amazing, isn't it? And then one day, day, all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus is standing in front of him, pointing at him and saying, follow me. That was it. That's all, that, that's all that was needed, two words. And suddenly Matthew was aware of an irresistible power and that he was being drawn. It's as if Jesus had cast the net of the gospel into the sea and caught Matthew. And Matthew was now being drawn, drawn, drawn towards Jesus. And one day soon his face was going to break the surface and you'd see in detail the face of the one who was calling him But now he just sensed that an alien power was at work in his life. And there was nothing he could do to fight it. The Bible talks, or theologians talk about irresistible grace. Once you hear God calling you, you will come to him. You cannot refuse him. He felt as if his heart was being opened to the truth, that his blind eyes were being opened. In John 6, 44, Jesus says, no one can come to the Father and, and, unless the Father draws him. And Matthew's being drawn. Now that's what happens when you start becoming a Christian. You have a sense, you have a sense that you're being dealt with. 
God is dealing with you. Now, of course, in Matthew's gospel here, it's happening in, in seconds. It can take years, sometimes, when you realize that you really aren't in control of your life. That's what happened to C.S. Lewis. For many years, he knew that God was calling him, that God was chasing him and coming for him, but he kept suppressing that knowledge and turning his back on him until there came a moment, he says in his autobiography, it must have been in the spring or summer of 1929, that I finally, I finally admitted that God was God. He couldn't resist. All the fight was taken out of him. All the resistance was gone. He was spent, but he's not yet a Christian. He's just come from an atheist. Now he's, he, now he's a theist. It took him a number of years later before he put his trust in Christ. But the point is this. The point is this. He comes to that point where there's no resistance. As you know, many years I've been doing Christianity Explore courses for years, off and on. Sometimes we don't run them because it's not a demand, but I've often run Christianity Explore courses, and pe what people sometimes say to me is, oh, I'm so glad to be joining this course. I'm look I, I want to find God, they say. I want to find God. I want to know him, and I want to believe in him, which is wonderful. But at the same time, my heart sinks. Because what they say to me is, I want, I, I want to study God. It's worth giving God, I think, an hour a week for seven weeks. I, I'll invest in that. But I, I want to examine God. I want to find about him because I've got questions. Questions that need answering. And as I say, there's a, a little fall in my heart because the reason... There's a fall in my heart. It's because they're saying to me, I, I, I want to examine God. I'm going to interrogate him. And the implication is what they're telling me up front, and I, I admire their honesty. They're basically saying to me, if God doesn't fit into what I think he should be like, then I'm not going to commit to him. So I say, well, can you give me an example? He said, well, I, don't, I can't possibly believe in a God that allows suffering. Okay, so, okay, stop there. I mean, you know, because God does allow suffering. God does send suffering into people's lives. He does that sometimes to wake them up, to shake their cage. He sent suffering into the life of Jesus, even when Jesus pleaded with him, Lord, may this cup be passed from me. And God said no, and he went to the cross. And so what they're saying to me is, I don't want my deepest beliefs to be challenged. So I'm willing to, I'm willing to come, but I want to hold on to my deepest beliefs. I want to make sure that God is on the right side of history. It's me. What a crazy assumption. I want to make sure that God is on the right side of history. I want to make sure that God is as progressive and liberal and as loving as I am, is what they're saying. I want to make sure that God believes in diversity, equality, and inclusion. And I want to make sure that God is very concerned about climate change because these are things I'm concerned about. Now let me say this, God is deeply concerned about his world. He made it. It's his world, and he is outraged. God is outraged at what we have done to his world. The way we've abused his world for our own ends, God is outraged. And God is deeply, deeply concerned 
about diversity, equality, and inclusion in ways that you and I can't even begin to imagine how concerned he is about those issues. Just look at the picture the Bible gives us of heaven. To talk about diversity and inclusion. But can you imagine, can you see the problem with this approach? Because at this stage of the exercise, they're not willing to let God deal with them. Not at all. They think they are dealing with him. Keeping him at arm's length. And let me just say this. You can spend years doing that. Years. In fact, you can go to church all your life. And every single Sunday, you're keeping God at arm's length. That's why you're going to church. Because as you go to church, you can say, God, you know, okay, you know, things are fine, leave me alone. But you see, when you become a Christian, what you realize is that it's not God, not you examining God. It's God examining you. And you are the one, then, who falls down on your knees and you should cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A few years ago, I went to Mount Athos, which is a a monastic republic in Greece, and there are all these monasteries and these Greek Orthodox monks. And I got into conversation with them one day, and they said, uh, do you know the Jesus prayer? I said, well, I'm not sure I do know the Jesus prayer. And they said, we'll learn this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the Jesus prayer. I said, wow, it's a great prayer. How often should I pray it? And this they said three times every ten minutes throughout your life. Three times every ten minutes for the rest of your life. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, now you're beginning to get the point that God deals with you. And so there's Matthew, a feeling as if a great power is coming to his life. But there's also something else at work. Look at what Jesus says. He says, Matthew, follow, follow me. Follow me. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, look, Matthew, I want you to follow a, a, a party line. I, I want you to commit yourself to an agenda. I want you to commit yourself to a program. I want to, you to commit yourself to a creed. I want you to commit yourself to a set of beliefs. Now, all those things will surely follow. But at this stage, what Jesus is asking you is to follow him. To put him first. And you think, well, why does Jesus do that? He does that because Jesus is front and center. You may think, well, that's very arrogant. Jesus putting himself first, but that's because he is the first. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is front and center. And of course, remember when we went through Matthew, Matthew's been telling us this all the time. Remember how Matthew began his gospel that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of the great King David, the son of David. He is also the son of man. So he's the son of David. He's born of the flesh. He's a son, he's a son of man. He's also the son of God because he's born of the Virgin Mary. And so in Jesus Christ, you have the son of man and the son of God. So he is front and center. And what this means is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth has complete authority over the whole world. He has complete authority over you. Complete authority over you. In Matthew chapter 8, just before this passage, Jesus has been healing a man with leprosy, which demonstrates his authority over all disease. And then he's in a storm, and with a single word, he stills a violent storm. 
which demonstrates that he has authority over, over nature. He then confronts two men possessed by demons, which demonstrates his authority over the spiritual realm. He then meets a man paralyzed on a mat, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Everybody says, are you God? Only God can forgive sin. And so Jesus is there saying to Matthew, follow me. Follow me. That's, that, that's a command, isn't it? That's a command. Jesus isn't saying, um, Matthew, uh, kind of, uh, it's great to meet you. Um, would you like to think about these things? You know, you may say no, but you know, hey, things are cool. Don't worry. That's not his approach. He says, follow me. And he's commanding each and every one of us this morning as well. You're here today. The reason you're here today is because God is commanding you to follow him. He says, he does this all the time. He says, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, 17. He says, come follow me, Matthew 4, 19. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. You must be born again, another command, John 3, 17, 3, 7. And so it goes on. He says, you must put me, imagine this. I say this. As a husband, a father, a great a, a grandfather, I've got, and the, I don't show how many grandchildren I have at the moment, they just keep on coming. But Jesus, Jesus said, listen to this, you must put me, you must put me above your father and your mother and your children and your family and your friends. Why? Because I am the Alpha and the Omega. And the beginning and the end. I was there, says Jesus, when you were conceived. I was there. I'm the beginning. I was at your beginning. I'll be there at the end when you die. Because I am at the beginning and I'm at the end of the whole universe. I'm also at the beginning and the end of your life. I'll be there. And as I say, if Jesus was doing that, 2,000 years ago, he's doing it today. What's the, what's, the, what's the appropriate response to this? The appropriate response must be to get up and leave. You just give up your life. My life's over. I give you, Jesus, I give you my life. Here, take it. I'm throwing it away. It's yours. I'll follow you. I'll be obedient to you from this moment on till the day I die. So the only proper response is to say, Dear Jesus, I have heard your call. I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. In the short term, I don't know where this is going to lead. Sometimes people say to me, Vicar, if I, if I do this, um, What's it going to cost? And then they say, will I have to come to church? Or they say, will I have to, will I have to, give, you, will I have to give you some money to the church? What they're trying to do is, if I commit to this, where is it going to lead? Let me just say this. You have no idea where this is going to lead. No idea. But that's true of any relationship, isn't it? When you get married and you say, I do, you don't know where that's going to lead. You've got no idea. When you sign a job, uh, you know, a contract at work, you've no idea where that job's going to lead you. And so all I can say is, I've no idea. If you commit to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I've no idea where it will lead. It may lead to persecution. Jesus did warn us about that. It may lead to persecution. So in the short term, I have no idea where it's going to lead, but
But I do know where it's going to lead ultimately. It's going to lead you to heaven and to everlasting glory and to everlasting joy. And it's going to, you're going to have that for all eternity. And so Jesus says, follow me. Put your trust in me. Will you do so? Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your call on our lives. Father, may we, may we hear that. May we all pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We thank you that you came to call sinners. Matthew was steeped in sin. The mountain he had to climb was enormous. The chasm between you and him was, couldn't be spanned. But in your grace, you came to him and called him. We pray, Father, that you would call each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.